namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami So we're coming to the end of our three-month retreat. It's sort of slightly deceptive, as if something's kind of ending, when really it just changes. Um, There's always that, you know, question, well, was that that useful? (laughs) Where where, Where does it take you? And is that just one other thing that happens and then, it's gone and life goes on as usual, you know. It seems that so often we, we can have it, we can be in experiences that when well, they're happening, you know, we're in it and it's all wonderful and terrible and whatever. And then, you know, ring the bell, turn the page and it's another story and what was all that about? <laughs> you know, things we can experience. So, You know, you you can't really um, place too much validity just on changing nature of appearances. You know, appearances are not just visual appearances, but appearances in the mind. We feel happy, we feel sad, we feel wonderful or dejected or convinced or despondent or whatever. And, you know, and then... Mm. so it's this sense of the very innate change of all this is something to itself is a tremendously useful teaching and uh, uh, practice in its own right just letting it all shift and change and what's what remains what is it that remains does anything remain what are you left with what does it take you to Mm. what can you take with you if you like if you're leaving the situation is changing what can you take with you what what are you left with what's been established Mm -hmm. it's not going to be quiet when it's not quiet it's not so stable things are coming and going it's not coherent you know. same as when we have, uh, have meditation retreats and then it finishes and then you go back and life is tumultuous as usual and <laughs> you know where, where, where did that all go uh, so it's quite a, a kind of common experience isn't it we might very well worry about it like oh right it was very nice and steady and calm and now what's going to happen now oh dear you know Things are going to start up, and uh, and so on. Mm. Appearances, changes, different kinds of feeling, different energies, different input happens. Perhaps when you leave the monastery, you know, there's a certain stability and uh, steadiness about it even predictable what happens when you leave that all kind of uh, it's got to fall apart hasn't it in one way it must it must go you know you can't carry visual experiences tempos uh, ryth- uh rhythms of day you can't carry them with you mm. they're all very susceptible to change pleasant people you can't always have pleasant calm people around you it's all that subject to change, isn't it? Doesn't mean it's not 
pleasant or useful, but the usefulness has to go beyond that. So one of the um, most really important um, qualities for people to find and establish and know and be in touch with in their lives is called faith. Uh, well, that's the English word for it. Actually, there's several English words for it. Confidence is perhaps better. Conviction, trust, confidence. Uh, something of this nature. With this, you feel together. You know, you feel okay. You can manage. You can manage the world of change. You have faith, you have confidence in something. Real deep confidence. And without it, life is very precarious. So, um, people in general look for something to have confidence in. Religions, Beliefs, um, financial security, political systems, or each other to find something that will feel reliable and solid and steady. Such an important thing to have that uh, experience. Without it, um, despair, despondency, depression, even uh, suicide, you know. If they lose that, if we, we don't have that, what's the point? can't really feel uh, steady, whole, complete. And so this is something that people instinctively search for. You know, when you're very small, it's in your parents. Um, You know, they give you that feeling of there is a solid reality here that will be there and look after you and so forth. Solid reference point. And then you gradually move through that and find out perhaps they're not so solid as you thought they were or they disappoint or they have the limitations. And then we look for something else and it goes on, doesn't it? Um, so is that there is that search for faith, for, a, for a, uh, an object or a situation to have confidence in. And we get it partially enough of it partially and yet it generally means we have to uh, uh, compromise we don't feel completely confident in that but we feel yeah it's 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 okay it's enough to keep going with and um, you know people will often subscribe to beliefs to to short to fill in the gaps you know God for example some God or another and uh, you know, and it it's, it can be it can give them a tremendous uh, uh, you know resource. So often one does find that in situations where life is not very certain, people have stronger faith in God, God or gods or great spirit or you know wherever it is, Shiva, Krishna, whatever. <laughs> Because there's not much else to hang on to, so you, you, uh, all that uh, need and gets projected onto uh, something beyond this world. If you can't find anything in this world, this world of appearances, then you try and find it somewhere else. And uh, so, quite a lot of religion is based upon that need to find confidence, and it can very uh, it go. It's often uh, in, play, in situations where there's not much confidence available in the worldly condition of uh, you know, wealth or security or uh, finances that people will place their faith in something immaterial, um, you know, religious, God, something they can't see. And, uh, and it, it keeps them going, you know. Yeah. And it's, it runs right across the board, human beings, whether they're, whatever they're Catholics or poor people in, in Sicily or somewhere like that, they have stronger faith than, you know, than 
well-heeled, sophisticated people living in Milan, in, this, in Milan, in the same country, who've got well, you know, they don't need God anymore because they got, you know, so many billion euros in the bank. <laughs> And uh, I was when I was in Tibet, noticing the tremendous people have this tremendous faith in, in their mantras and their prostrations, and you know, in that, and it, it keeps them going through some very, very difficult circumstances. So you, you know, you can kind of poo-poo it as uh, you know, just superstitious, but it, it does work in some in some sense. If without that, what would it be like? You know? What would it be like without that? How would those people survive? How would they just not end up falling apart psychologically without something? It keeps them going. And if that source of faith says, well, you know, uh, if, you, if you have faith in this, then you've got to be be good, behave, be kind, be wise. You know, <laughs> that's what that's what's part of the part of the equation. Then this is not necessarily a a bad thing, is it? Mm. Uh, so I, I really didn't have much of a religious upbringing. I used to, we used to have religious education in school. We'd read the Bible, and which didn't really make a lot of sense. But it was quite bits we were quite interesting, and the kind of bashing and begatting of people. Seemed, when you're about twelve, that seemed quite interesting. God was either slaying or begatting, people were slaying and begatting each other. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't something you felt you really could, uh, you know, find that more relevant than what was going on on television, which was pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the New Testament was somewhat different, and then. And, and, and Jesus and uh, dying to save us from one's sins, which is pretty mind-boggling, you know. Like, how's that going to help me? But somebody went through this horrible experience uh, with some sense of uh, doing it for my welfare. You think, well, that's, you know, pretty amazing. And um, love and forgiveness and so forth. So I remember I was about 15 or so, really trying to get this, and uh, you know, get get it because it, it is still couldn't quite get how this person going through this miserable experience of being nailed up on a cross was actually going to going to help me any. So I was, you know, I was kind of trying to be grateful for it. Um, but then I noticed there was a few people in the school who, who really got it, who really got it, and these they were kind of lit up, you know. And some of them were the teachers, they were really lit up with it. They were very, very convinced, very passionate. And I thought, well, I wish I felt like that. They really felt, you know, this is it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is there for me. Um, Jesus is going to look after me. I've opened my heart to Jesus. He's here for me. Thought, well, that's great. How do you get it? Because it wasn't happening for me. Well, I was very, you know, impressed with people who could get it. Because they seemed so tremendously, uh, such a tremendous pivot in their life. And I was confused as to what was right and what was wrong. And, you know, life didn't look very good. There were threats of nuclear war and being wiped out by, you know, bomb, nuclear bombs at that time in the 60s. And the economy was slumping. It was, you know, what's the point of all this? So there wasn't really... Uh, a source of something what I could I couldn't get it, but I could certainly respect, in some sense, people who did get it. You know, got something out of it because they felt so seemed so solid and uh, life was manageable from that position. Mm. But it wasn't happening for me, so that's in a way that kind of got me inquiring. Is the how do you find a center, an axis, kind of a, a something you can orient around when things in some ways seem so meaningless or relatively so? You, know, you can believe in this or you could believe in that, but 
you know, you could be, you know, an anarchist or a democrat or a monarchist or you could be a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian and you could believe in any of them, well, which was the right one? And so it all seemed very relative to me, nothing that felt so absolute and ultimate and solid, um, just matters of opinion. And uh, so, you know, where does it come from? Where does, what, how do you, what's the experience of that? Whatever triggers it, whether it's, um, you know, Jesus or Buddha or Allah or Muhammad, what is it, what's the experience of it? Experience of a sense of certainty, conviction, that enables one to feel uh, steady, calm, uh, together, coherent, not falling apart, in the face of circumstances. When things are changing, when people are falling apart, when there is death, when there is poverty, when there is crisis, when there is conflict and you still feel, un, you know, you still feel together. That's what, that's what that word that small word means. We tend to take it as belief because sometimes people will adopt a belief in order to have that experience. They'll hold on to a belief in order to have that experience. But what I noticed also that people who came from that always had to go around convincing everybody else of it (laughs) in order to keep their belief their faith strong, then believing it themselves wasn't enough. You've got to go and tell somebody else and get them to believe it and then you feel you've, you know, your belief has been amplified. So I sometimes I meet, um, there were lots of evangelists. You know, you'd meet those come around, they'd knock on your door and would you be interested in this, that and the other? And, uh, and obviously they felt some tremendous need to, to get other people to believe in what gave them their sense of conviction. And the flip side of it, of course, is that with these and with other folks, um, you know, that thing can go off, and then suddenly, you know, they get disillusioned. Either the teacher or the system or the church or the leader or whatever fails, and then the whole thing crumbles, and there's this huge fallout, disillusionment. Which, um, you know, and then uh, you know, people really plummet in that, as we do when we feel betrayed by another person we placed our trust in. You feel that same sense of something lurches, and you don't feel so solid anymore because the person you had faith in has let you down. Uh, they weren't honest. They weren't true. They weren't what they said they were. And there's this huge cascading of falling and disappointment and you feel quite unsteady with that. So the faith is a very important experience. The problem is that we will often, can we place it on something that's not going to fall away? Because if you place it on something that does fall away, then when that falls away, there's such a huge uh, loss and despair. And as it happens with many, uh, in, in cases where people have had faith in some spiritual teacher and then he or she blows it, generally it's money or sex or power or something or the other, and they lose it completely. And then, you know, the person who had faith in them is devastated and they'd never have faith in anybody else again. They can never, they lose it completely. One of our... Well, one of our training rules is to, to uh, you can't claim enlightenment, for example, <clears throat> even if it's true. Even if you are awakened, you can't, you shouldn't make public claims about it. If you're not awakened and you claim it, then that's, that's considered a, a defeat offense. It means you have to leave the order. That's pretty serious, isn't it? So if you claim to be awakened and you know you're not, then... Um, that's it. Because making such a claim means you draw other people's faith towards you. And if you're not capable of really holding that, then 
a huge there's such a huge fallout from that so the book it's like it's like killing people and there's only these four offenses in the training rules that amount to this what's called defeat and one of them is this claiming to be awakened when you're not or even claiming any kind of super normal state when you don't have it because from a Buddha's point of view in this way you're killing people you're, you're killing them but you're killing their faith element hmm? what's it like when you lose faith yeah. and some people lose faith they never get it again when they've been uh, had placed all their faith or their confidence or someone who wasn't capable of living up to it and then that they, they lose that sometimes they're never able to have faith in anything again so it's why you know you're looking really into the nature of the human heart human being and respecting it so and the other training was even if you are awake and then you still don't make any claim about it because it's it's the danger of it is then that the person has faith in, in you rather than in what you're pointing at. <laughs> yeah. what, you've, what you've experienced or how you got there. And then, so the important thing is to say, well, you know, th- look, this is what you can do where you can go there and you don't make any claim about yourself even if you've realize that so that's that's uh to my mind it's very skillful because it it places one's or it directs one's faith one's faith element towards a place where you're not going to lose it because it's been established by your own clear process that you've worked on and arrived at yourself not upon something external to that not something that's been given to you or something that you've believed in but something you've actually dug or unraveled or found your way to when you find your own way to it through your own clarity and your own reliable uh, examinations then you know you know that and something has shifted something has changed And essentially, this quality of, of uh, complete faith in, in the Buddhist understanding is it's this sense of not being the unshakable, not being shaken by circumstances. That's one way of putting it. Uh, and from the world of circumstances and appearances, it sounds kind of negative. Mm. From the world of the world of circumstances and appearances and feelings and thoughts, it sounds negative because it's sometimes expressed as a complete sense of disenchantment <laughs> with the world of appearances. You don't believe in it, you don't buy into it, you don't you're not convinced by it, you're not you know, excited by it, you're not annoyed by it, you're not you're just not in it. It's just that, and uh, from the person, from the person who only knows the world of circumstances and appearances, this sounds like so negative and cynical. Until you, but through practice, you begin to recognise what the world of circumstances and appearances does. It certainly happens, but it doesn't go anywhere conclusive. It doesn't go anywhere final. It doesn't go anywhere really solid. It just keeps on rolling like a, like one of those um, Mandelbrot sets. Have you ever seen that thing? This kind of computer-generated image that through, through running a mathematical form, it just produces an endless cascade of images that has no end. And every one of them is dazzling. And then press a button it goes on another one appears like an ever rolling kaleidoscope yeah and they're all of them wow look at that look at that look at that and they're not oh look at that and after maybe an hour you're going 
but but <laughs> so what <laughs> and uh, that's that, that <laughs> yeah. so you know in contemplation you're contemplating the world of appearances and circumstances events and phenomena and you think yeah and then and then and then and so what you know and through processes like meditation and retreats it's you know we have particular systems and and meditation exercises yeah but they act as kind of primers for your attention sharpen your attention, clarify your attention, and clarify your awareness. And often what's happening is you're just spooling, scrolling through these mental scenarios. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, memories, thoughts, impressions, feelings, moods, hopes, anticipations, passions, disappointments, projects, issues with some other being, other person, the past, present, future, alive, dead, near or far, somebody you're kind of wrangling with or psyched up about, <laughs> or yourself, <laughs> scrolling through this stuff, you know. And that's what happens on retreats. People think, oh, you know, what's your technique? And I mean, no, it doesn't matter really what the technique is. I, I have a sort of a technique I teach. But notice after a while, yeah, nobody really does it. Um, and then after a while I notice well actually I don't do it <laughs> all, all the time either I start off with that and give it a go and then after a while the mind sort of yeah, and it wanders a bit and then you kind of pull it back a bit and then you wanders a bit and you pull it back and you, what's going on and you know, there's this kind of feelings, moods, perceptions images uh, painful ones terrible ones, joyful ones irritating ones, niggly ones, stupid ones. You know, some little ditty starts going in your brain and you think, oh, what's that? <laughs> Who's that? What's that remind me of? And uh, scrolling through stuff. And, and uh, after a while, getting less and less um, activated by it. You, know, you don't really find an issue with it. You don't search for an end for it. You don't analyse yourself in terms of it. You, you just... This is the mind. This is what minds do, don't they? On one level. They kind of operate like this. And you're just like, it's like, it's like when you have a rattle when you're a baby. You see little kids, little tots in their, in their carriages and they often the mother will have, have a string with these beads and the little baby will kind of pat this thing and it rattles around. Um, you know, keeps the little, little one occupied. But after a while, you, you don't do that. You know, you grow up. You come out of that. It doesn't get you going. And this is rather like the process of retreats and meditation. It's rather like that. Like You're not excited by the teddy bear anymore or disappointed by it. It's just, it's not an issue. Yeah. And the, the scrolls, the stories, and the phenomena of the mind eventually become something that's not really a topic, an issue. And when it's no longer an issue, it's sort of the colours drain and fade away. And oh, you know. oh, it does that, doesn't it? It drains, it fades, it's that. And that's not through aversion or. It just that's what it does when you don't activate it, we don't get stimulated by it, you don't identify with it, we don't make an issue out of it. It tends to drain and fade. And in the draining and the fading, you don't feel drained yourself. You feel clear and steady and grounded and simple and open and obvious and uh huh. You know. The the like the music's playing but you're not dancing and eventually the music starts to fade 
Well, it's just this kind of process that happens. And the beauty of, of uh, uh, something of that nature is, is that it, it's not through volition. You see, we're not trying to make it fade. It's like you're, or you're trying to believe in fading as something that's good for you. Or uh, trying to make it work. It just does it. And that's why one can have faith in it, because it's faith that it's something that arises almost of its own nature, or, or ceases of its own nature. And the somewhat paradoxical um, realizations uh, in Buddhism are about ceasing. Ceasing doesn't sound very good. You have faith in ceasing? <laughs> it sounds so negative. From the point of view of appearances and circumstances and events, it sounds kind of negative. As an experience, it's anything but negative. <laughs> and the mind feels kind of steady and clear and peaceful and calm. The heart isn't agitated. Yeah. And through really getting that as through when faith when you begin to get that with a sense of understanding it, then faith is established through wisdom rather than belief. That is through wisely knowing and seeing phenomena or most anything the mind can do. That's why it's so useful to see it not in terms of a particular circumstance or a particular even level of concentration or a particular situation, but just seeing it, this is what the mind does, and you can begin to get the intuition and the confidence that whatever arises in the mind is of the nature to cease. And the ceasing is not dead or annihilated, it's extremely affirmative. Uh, clarifying, uh, valuing, enhancing. You get a sense of something unshakable through that. And this is because, just because the, this is the way the mind, because of the nature of mind, or chitta. And just to explain this, this term, because we have you know, a word like mind is quite a, a minefield of interpretations, but that was what the chitta, like this monastery is called chitta viveka, which means the mind that is not um, attached. It's a reference to, to a quality of the ceasing, peaceful mind, or a peaceful mind. It doesn't really exactly translate, but it's a mind that's withdrawn from getting engaged and activated, and it says peaceful. And it really means, uh, chitta means something more, perhaps more usefully like awareness. Sometimes people translate it as heart. Basically because uh, often the understanding of, of what mind is, is the thinking system, thinking and, and organizing. Uh, and that's an aspect of mind, but we would see that very much as just one particular aspect of mind. Uh, and the fundamental aspect of, of mind as awareness is, it does two particular processes. One, it is affected. It's affected, it's in a way that sights, sounds, touches have, have an effect. In, we seem to internalize them. They don't just affect our eyes, they affect an awareness. We feel moved, we feel happy. Um, it's associated with feeling. It's associated with what's called perception or impressions. That is something means something to us. We're able to restore that meaning. Mm. Yeah, so but feeling is the quality of pleasure or pain. Perception or impression is the sense of something means something. It means something like you see an object and you know, oh, that's a car. 
You don't have to, and that, that stays with you. Next time you see it, you still know it's a car, and you begin to identify other objects made of metal with wheels on as cars. You don't have to kind of keep discovering what the thing is. You have a way of of assessing experience and storing up the meaning of it, and then you know you can then use that meaning. Of course, that's a very complex uh, um, process because we have simple meanings like car, tree, cow, dog, bell, and you have more complex meanings like uh, important, unimportant, urgent, uh, lovely, friendly, beautiful, and so forth, which are much more complex in their power to move us. Uh, you know? So you get meanings which are have extreme extreme potency to us they, where we are very where we store them up something sacred that's another powerful one isn't it um, something holy something lovely um, friendly welcoming and then disgusting vile you know these are tremendously powerful meanings uh, and where do they happen Does a rose say, I'm beautiful? No, it happens in this awareness, doesn't it? So there's this whole area of perceptions, and what comes up with that is various degrees of response. We feel activated. We feel trembling, we feel defensive, we feel something reaches out, we feel uplifted, something activates. So these three things, this is the, all this is the nature of being affected. We feel, we're in, we have an impression, and there's some kind of activation of response. And that happens. That's what happens in awareness, in chitta. Hmm? So all the time, you know, that's going on. Everything is, is running in. It's touching that particular experience. It's being processed through that. Is that interesting? Is that important? Should I remember it? What does he mean by that? You know, oh, I should write that down. No, I don't forget, you know, some responding activation that's going on all the time. Mm-hmm. That's what everyone knows. They may not be able to define it, but that's what's happening for everyone, isn't it? So much so that we take it for granted. Until you find somebody else is not activated by that. They didn't think it was important or interesting or funny or beautiful. What's wrong with him? (laughs) And you begin to recognize these qualities are very changeable. And something one feels delighted by one day, two years later, doesn't seem so good anymore. And yet at the time, it filled you. It activated you. You were, you were on fire with it, or you were happy with it, and now it's gone. So this world of, of, a, of a process of awareness is both, it floods us and becomes our reality, but it's also extremely changeable and volatile. And yet, what else is there? Hmm? This is the issue of awareness of chitta and this is uh, so this becomes our self so one thing is effective and responsive the other aspect of it of chitta is it becomes our self this is what I am this is what, because this is what I'm experiencing what else could I be I'm in this this is you know I'm not anywhere else this is happening to me I'm feeling this this is happening in my mind or my heart or whatever you want to call it and I'm feeling like this about it. I'm responding in this way. This is me feeling joyful or angry or upset. Yeah. That's, that's, that's mine. All that's me. So jitta assembles a sense of myself. It feels, it's affected. So it's both a, that and it also establishes an ontology, a sense of being something. And the two are seemingly inextricable. Whatever is felt, whatever is uh, perceived, that I am. That's happening to me. Whatever rises up as a response, I'm doing that. I'm frightened. I'm happy. I'm 
convinced, you know, that's it. So they seem so totally inextricable. The process of med- meditation starts the no, it's not inextricable. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, you begin to linger a little longer in that process of cause, which is something happens to me, yeah. and effect. I therefore do this. Cause, call it, you know, effect or being affected and responded, responding. One is the cause, you get triggered and then you act, activate. And as, you, as you're meditating and kind of calming and slowing the mind, you begin to witness that process of this is happening to me and I feel like that and I do that. Who is that? And you notice there's, there's two different things. You know? you know, the me who's affected uh, is... Uh, Something penetrates me. Something comes into me. I'm sometimes astonished, or and then the me who reaches out is is not is of a different nature. And um, you know, though the two seem inextricable, but when you begin to quiet and calm the mind and just linger in being affected without reacting to it or noticing the reaction and beginning to slow down the cascade of reactions. So that happened to me, and I feel disappointed, and how dare... No, I'm just feeling disappointed. Instead of, how dare they, and after all I've done, and so forth. So You kind of begin to trim down the story of the reaction. Something happens to me, and instead of going through the last 10 years of my life when this happened and she said that and he just got feeling disappointed. Because you've heard the story and it didn't get you anywhere good. You've heard the reaction. You've been with the reaction and it didn't take you anywhere useful. You just got more snarled up in it to this kind of dead-end place of feeling, you know, if it's negative, you feel stuck with it. If you was excited, you want another one. And, you know, and you've been there. And for a while you begin to not want to go there anymore because it's a dead end. More of the same. And actually you begin to see wherever it takes you is purely either a memory or an anticipation or a projection. Nothing really solid. Just a phantom, a fantasy. Mm. Yeah. You know, when it's affected by something, by some, somebody says something, and you come up with, she's like this, and I'm always like that. And, you know, where's all that? Where did it go? And we're creating these scenarios in our minds, or something's creating these scenarios, these images and impressions and you know you find after, with doing that we're just sitting there and it's happening and you're sensing as the process goes on you're sensing yourself absorbed in it held by it sometimes tensed up by it sometimes weighed down by it this is all just coming out of my own awareness my own mind's doing this to me and you open your eyes and everything's fine. Where's the problem? <laughs> and all that was created purely by this cascading se- series of reactions and narratives and stories. So suddenly you start to lo- get disenchanted with that process of generating that. And it's a slow process because you, first of all you see it but you can't stop it. You notice it. Here I am again, going into that particular pattern of got to do this, got to do that, I'm like this, you like that, and feel suffering and stress, but can't do anything about it. And then you begin to 
through pros- being with that, find those places where you can just begin to relax, calm down, forgive, let go, step back, disengage. You find that place of release. You begin to disengage from the story. The conviction in the stories, the conviction in the reactions, the belief that the reactions really are valid and useful. And so essentially what happens is that the me impacted does not, the I am begins to become less convinced. Mm-hmm. The effect, and instead of the immediate fully formed conviction in my reactions and responses, I go, oh, here I go again. I'm getting annoyed, feeling frustrated. I've been with this a lot, a lot. And your mind widens and disengages. And you go, there he is. Uh huh. And just <laughs> the thing starts to crumble, starts to break up, just through the lack of conviction in it. Hmm? It's called disenchantment. And yet, the process of becoming disenchanted is not through finding fault or dismissing or being cynical, but just through waking up to it. Where's this going? Goes on to nowhere, solid, real, convincing, final, conclusive, satisfactory, just goes on. And I don't want to put any more energy into it. Something ceases to put emotional energy into it. So the I am, the I sense of that, becomes, oh, this is my anxiety. Oh, this is excitement oh this is trying to make things work oh this is that not I at all these are reactions and responses and begin to disengage from that and through that process of disengaging not giving energy to them these things quieten down the expression is Buddhist expression is all sankharas are impermanent they have the nature to cease what that means is these activities and responses and reactions if you don't put energy into them rather like you know not blowing up a balloon it it goes down because they, they, they can only be supported by constant input and so we begin to to recognize how the mind gives input into these and how to not put input into it. It's a kind of disenchantment with doing that. So the feeling and the perception and the impact does not have to generate a being. So rather than these two qualities of of awareness, that is the feeling sense and the being sense being inextricably uh, connected, they start to be disjoined. That is, there's feeling, there's an impression, and there isn't that reaction. Or there's less of a reaction. Or the reaction is just seen as a simple reflex that has no long-lasting effect. It doesn't become me. It's just, uh-huh. And then you notice it falls away. Uh, and this is called ceasing. <laughs> this is the process of ceasing. And because it's something that is associated with just seeing truly how things are rather than having to put energy into something and input into it and believe in it. It has a supreme quality of faith because it's a faith that almost speaks for itself. That is, ceasing 
speaks for itself. You don't have to speak for it. You don't have to believe in it or be convinced by it. It speaks for itself. It just does it. And the result of that is there's a quality of steadiness, composure, openness, ease. You feel solid. And what are you feeling solid about? Ceasing. <laughs> Which again from the world of appearances and circumstances sounds bizarre, you know. When you're looking at direct experience. The ceasing of agitation, the ceasing of proliferation, the ceasing of rambling on. The the mind, instead of being filled and saturated, feels open, there's space, there's quietness, there's openness, there's a certain... And that itself has a kind of feeling to it. A feeling of ease. It's called the highest or the most useful paramang, sukkang. Most useful, the most the most furthering kind of happiness, because it's a happiness that's not conditioned by particular input, but just comes through noticing the way things really are, however they are. And because it's to do with the process of phenomena, any phenomenon, it's universal, it's portable. Where if it was because of a particular phenomenon, it would be limited to the times that that particular phenomenon occurred, wouldn't it? If it's a sound or a sight or a flavor or a mood, then when that isn't there, you wouldn't have the same experience. So that flavor or mood or sight or sound might be extremely happy and wonderful and great, very nice. But then what happens when it's gone? The happiness of ceasing (laughs) <laughs> it's that everything does it. <laughs> so it's not, uh, it's not limited, it's called unconditioned. Yeah. So when, this is because of, of awareness being the way it is. Awareness is both uh, has this sense of being affected and it generates a sense of being out of the process of being affected and responding. The other feature of awareness, of course, is that it's aware. And what awareness is like, um, you know, it's it's. It's knowing that has no specific object. It, it, it automatically is in, innately knowing, innately apprehensive, innately sensitive, innately open, innately uh, of that nature. So when, you know, so there's the feeling, the effect, and there's the knowing. And as the, or the knowing, but knowing again sounds too cerebral. There's a kind of like the quality of, of awareness, awareness awaring itself. <laughs> yeah. And there's no particular adjective you can place upon it. Awaring is just open, steady, un, no boundaries, no definitions, no designations. If it had a designation, or definition, it would be another feeling, another object. But awareness is no particular object. That's why it's able, rather like water having no colour. You know, so you can put blue or green or whatever, and the water will accept become blue. Put green in it, the water becomes green. Because the water has no innate colour of its own, it can adopt and accept any colour. Yeah, rather like awareness. Awareness can be You can drop anger in it, or you can drop love in it, or you can drop very complex processes in it, and it becomes them. (laughs) Because it has no innate tone or texture of its own. But, did you say that with water, I mean water doesn't exist? No. 
Water exists, it just doesn't have a colour. But if you're looking to, if you only believe that existing things have colours, then you say something doesn't have a colour doesn't exist, so water doesn't exist. You say, no, no, it does exist, it's just you're measuring it in the wrong way. If you're measuring in terms of colour, you know, then you're using the wrong kind of measurement. Same as if you're measuring awareness in terms of feeling or mood or perception or impressions or activations, you say it doesn't exist because it doesn't have them. <laughs> That's why it can adopt any of them because you know, it's the nature of human minds, isn't it? It can do just about anything. From the most fiendish, the most beautiful, angelic, it can adopt any of them. We could believe the moon's made out of green cheese, we could believe that you know, the world was created 6,200 BC. They believed that some time ago. Um, you know, and that belief, if you believe in it, it's believable. <laughs> but you can, <laughs> awareness can adopt any of these. The beauty of it is that when there becomes this increasing disenchantment and dispassion towards phenomena towards what manifests, towards what arises, towards perceptions and feelings and activities, and they cease or they dwindle or they fade, something realizes awareness is aware. It's nothing more than that. And yet that is unshakable, unbounded, measureless, doesn't fall away. If you can have faith in anything, it's going to arise on that. That search for security, for stability, when it t- touches that, it's going to say, hey, this is the thing. You know, the thing that's the nothing. This is, this is the place where there isn't shaking, where there isn't falling away, where there isn't loss, where there isn't disillusionment. This is the place. Yeah. I'm just using terms as best I can for that. It's like if you've been following colours and sounds and sights and believing that's it, as of course they do happen. They are appearances. They do definitely happen. There's no doubt about that. And you begin to see, like clearing the water. Can you imagine having only ever seen water carrying sticks and oil and fish in it you know and you so you thought water was a mass of sticks and oil and colors and fish because that's all you'd ever seen and somebody somebody cleaned it and took all that out what's that and it's always been there and you saw it and you, you didn't see it you looked at the water, you saw the colour, you saw the sticks, you saw the fish, and you thought, yeah, and you, you saw it, and yet you didn't see it, because you saw the phenomena. Mm. And what would it be like if somebody took that out? You know, yes, of course, it's there all the time, isn't it? It's the thing that carries them. It's the thing that allows phenomena to arise. If we weren't aware of them, we wouldn't, they wouldn't arise, would they? You know, something only happens for you because it arises in your awareness. If there was no awareness, it wouldn't arise, right? Yeah. You only see things. Your eyes, if, you're, if there's no awareness there, then you don't get the meaning of it. So what is it? And you just begin to realize, well... That's the undying, the non-changing, the boundless, the measureless. It doesn't have a designation. It doesn't have a definition. It doesn't have a color, shape, sound, mood, feeling. But it doesn't reject them either. It just says, that's that. It's like that. It arises, it passes. You can follow it if you like. And it will take you to the ever on-rolling story that never ends and you can follow that as long as you want and you'll never get to the end of it Uh, and you won't feel satisfied by it but go right ahead (laughs) 
until you think, I'm tired of this. It's not giving me the sense of security, stability, happiness that I need. It's, it's, you know, like that, isn't it? It's like an endless sail. Sail, where they're saying, this is the new, this is the wonderful, buy one of these, and as soon as you get it, oh, well, you need a new thing. You never get the final satisfactory thing. And that's the nature of phenomena. There's nothing finally wrong with them, other than that's just the limitation. If you don't ask more than that, then you're not disappointed with it. And this quality of disenchantment or dispassion, again, is not a rejection. It's just saying that's that's the limitation. That's what they do. Uh Uh-huh. Enough. Not particularly hungry for more of that. But that's okay. It can happen. But where you become more centered, where your faith resides, is in awareness itself. This is what, like, when we say citta viveka, viveka is the movement, sometimes translated as withdrawal or disengagement, a movement towards awareness itself rather than being placed in phenomena, in objects. So we can begin to recognize that awareness has these different levels to it. There's a, a very activated feeling aspect of it. But right, you could almost say right in the center, if you like to have a graphic image, it's very still. And that uh, is also a quality that is felt through the whole field of awareness. Once you begin to recognize the still point, the point of disbelief, of dispassion, it starts to radiate its quality of ease and coolness through the entire field of the mind, of the awareness. So, and with that, again, this whole thing about self and not self, which again is is quite difficult because once one has only understood and seeing things in terms of the the I am that does and reacts and people address and everybody's believing in it, so you, you know, it becomes adopted. And uh, there's you know you can do good things with it and so on and so on and so on and it's full of stories and vitality and energies and processes and possibilities and lovely stuff and strange stuff and so forth. It's incredibly rich. And yet, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the Mandelbrot set. <laughs> you seen it? You should have a look at it sometime. It's incredibly rich. They've tracked this for millions, millions of, of equations to create this thing. It just goes on and on and on for hours. It never stops. There's no end to it. And it's very beautiful and very rich and very uh, intricate. And yet, (laughs) there's that. And trying to, but making that into something that's permanent, solid, substantial, that you could rely upon and trust to be unchanging and invariable, this is not possible. So when you, this, this is where the anatta, not self, because you don't take faith, you don't place your faith, you don't place your center upon all these very intricate and complex reactions and processes because they are the nature to cease. And that's not annihilating them, it's just acknowledging 
them for what they are. And there's this, there's this knowing of that, which you can't really create a person out of, because it's not to do with creating anything. It's not to do with believing in something, or disbelieving in it, or affirming it, or denying it. It's not to do with any activity. So you, the process of assembling a vivid person out of it just can't take place. And yet it's supremely peaceful, calm, open, balancing, gives one a sense of confidence. It's got a subtly pleasant feeling to it and can stay through all of it, through, through a lifetime when bits of yourself start to change. As they do, don't they? Break up, become reliable. So it's also called a refuge from the world of change. What is it that helps us to remember that, to access that, to you know stay in touch with that? This is gives us. Uh, this is your own question. What is it that helps you stay in touch with that? Sitting, watching your breath, fine. Chanting, fine. What helps you to stay in touch with it? Really, it's a process of, my, my sense of it, whatever you do, you're going to be working with your awareness. You're going to be calming a feeling or arousing an activation, arousing a sense of trust, arousing some patience, arousing clarity. You're going to be deliberately working against the habits, the stuck places, the locks, the ongoing narratives that you've heard a thousand times, the self that you're feeling disappointed by, you're going to be continually working against that. You're going to be continually looking at that, massaging it, checking it out, befriending it, welcoming it, calming it. You're going to be working on it. You work on yourself. <laughs> and it's... The, and you, each and every one of us have to know which particular, you know, bits of that paradigm of self are accessible, that you've really seen as something that I've had enough of this one or this one needs some caring for, you know, this one needs some response to in order to free it up. That's what you take with you. You take with you a sense of path. And maybe a sense of there's a few simple reminders, aren't there? Be, be steady, take your time, look carefully, look thoroughly, don't react. Generate the field of goodwill around all of it. Working with goodwill. And, uh, yeah because this is for one's welfare hmm? you take that with you mindfulness, goodwill attentiveness, vigilance dispassion take these and then you know you find your life you follow those your life is going to shape up uh, around that uh, and always, always leads one way to enhancing your access to the uh, unconditioned, where one's faith is supremely uh, placed. So, I offer this for your reflection this evening. <laughs>